This conference will now be recorded. People this can conference be a bit shy. will now be recorded. Um, we just press records for the best i was late and if anybody wants to have a follow-up um, to to this you're also able to get access to the slides if anyone wants this post this so we'll ping out an email to you um, and if you want the slides um, then you can we can make them available to you so uh, if you can find the comments box usually it's over to the right I won't make this too interruptive but just to check the people there you can either message me um, message to everybody or you can just message to myself so I'm Lucinda and I should probably come up um, it might come up to Helen as presenter, actually, organisers. Um, but to be honest, just say hello to everybody <coughs> and um, let me know you're there and let's see where it comes through. And I will start the presentation. Hi, thank you very much, Laura. It's good to know. There's something about webinars where it does feel a little bit like you're talking to a wall. Hi, Catherine. Thanks, guys. Um, so it's just, no, it's just nice to know there's people out there. So uh, this is a this this is actually our talent management strategy. I will pay attention to my slides for a minute. So if I don't see your comments instantly, I will refer back to them. And that means that if you have questions, feel free to pop them in the comments box as we go through. Um, and there'll be a few interactive points where I'll just ask you to indicate um, what your answer is to a specific question to give us a sense of involvement. So thanks everyone for joining me, and uh, I will move on to my first slide. So. What we're going to do in um, our overall, our broad agenda of this particular webinar is we're going to explain what we mean by talent management. Um, we're going to look at it in context of talent management and other strategies. It struck me that sometimes we're always being asked to be strategic. What's the difference between an HR talent management, OD strategy, etc.? We'll then think about what the purpose of a talent management strategy might be and what activities may constitute talent management. And then finally, we'll look at a, an example case study and consider how we can develop and implement something like this in our businesses or organizations wherever you are from. So hopefully that's the subject that you are intending to, to be here for and is of interest to you. Just introducing myself, so my background is a number of corporate L&D and then it was on to sort of more OD roles. So I have had to um, implement and define talent management strategies on numerous occasions. Um, I'm also yeah. a psychologist by training. Um, I run a software business so we're just going to meet, meet someone who's come in there and uh, so I run a software business called Actus and we host all of these things through Actus it's all part of our value add um, it fits very much because um, we are about trying to support businesses in developing talent uh, managing talent and that's one of this is one of the ways in which we can do that by providing you with um, guidance and advice from our experience with many many different clients as to what might work for you because it's not one size fits all if you haven't come across our HR Uprising podcast, um, you might also enjoy that. And there will be an episode that corresponds with this webinar that will go out on the HR Uprising podcast in a couple of weeks. And uh, the rest you can read for yourself. I've got a 16-year-old and a 13-year-old, and, and I'm a keen but pretty average uh, netball player. So I'm just going to check that the meeting's working over here. So let's just mute all there. That's it. So we haven't got the interruptions coming through. <clears throat> So moving on to our next slide. So I did threaten earlier to do the, um, the poll and a few more people have just come in as you might have heard from the uh, noises coming in. I just wondered who else, I just said I've, I've admitted I've had my lunch. So you've got a, a yes, no, it's very simple. Yes, no, or you're eating it now status in the chat. Let me know, it is lunchtime. Don't tell me you're doing a massive fast for the day. So who's who's sitting at their desk eating their, their sandwiches or they've already gobbled it down or you're going to wait until after this webinar, which I suspect will take about 30 minutes. That's it. Add it in the chat box here. Oh, yeah, good. That's very good, Caitlin. That is a, a good use of time prioritisation. So no one's too starving and others are eating it now, which is fine. I can't hear you munching because I've muted. It's totally fine. So moving on to the main content of the slides here. As I said to earlier, I thought that many of the people on this call, and that by all means, maybe put your job role in as we're here. Let me know, are you a talent person? Is that actually in your job title? Are you a learning development? Are you broad HR? Just give me an indication of the sort of people I've got in the audience. Um, 
However, it strikes me that we have this jargon, don't we? We talk about talent, we talk about organisational development, HR, learning and development, and all of those can have strategies. And I can see I've got a number of people with talent on there, so hence you probably know as much or maybe more you can add to this here. But I don't know, I wondered, have you thought about how um, talent management fits into any of those other strategies? Now, it's my experience that it can be a little bit of an overlap really and it can be a bit confusing and I don't think we need to matter too much in terms of semantics but this is my take on it and so my take on it is that actually it doesn't matter whether we start from the left or the right if we start at the top here I'm saying at the left I actually believe that an organizational development strategy I'll go into what's covered in each of those is possibly encompassing more things than an HR strategy now, I think that an HR strategy may well be broader, again, than a talent management strategy, which I see as having a quite a specific purpose. And then I see a learning and development strategy. It will be both broader or more, um, and narrower, if you like, I see it. So I see it more as being specifically about L&D interventions, but it might be focused on a broader audience. Now, it doesn't matter which they are, none is better than the other. I've certainly been in a talent role where I've had responsibility for aspects of OD and of learning and development. HR may have all of those things. It doesn't matter a huge amount where you sit, but it's sufficient to think that actually there are subtle differences potentially between them but whichever we look at, we must make sure they're aligned with the business strategy. In terms of me trying to work out what those subtle differences might be, for if it's useful, um, I believe, I'll start from the right this time, that an L&D, if your responsibility is learning and development, then actually you're probably looking to deliver more holistic development opportunities for all. Now, you would have some top-down or strategic deliver deliverables, but a lot of what you're doing might be based on what learners are asking for or giving them the right information when they need it or the right training in line with a, a training needs analysis. So it might be about the individual's skills or the role that they're in as well as aligning with maybe strategic deliverables, which might be a management or a leadership development program. It might be that you have responsibility for specific um, L&D aspects of a talent management strategy. Now, I see the talent management piece, which it may be more, um, more, more, more narrow, if you like. Um, now, that's not to say this will come onto a slide I have later as to how you define talent in your particular organisation, but um, a talent management strategy is likely to be more specific to either a population, a group of people, or a set of skills. So let's say it's a new set of skills that you need to bring into the organisation in order to be competitive in the marketplace, or it might be a key set of legacy skills that you need to retain um, in a competitive environment. So I'd see that that is where it might end up being slightly narrower in terms of the numbers of people or the, um, the, the width of the organisation that it straddles. Now, your HR strategy, you can have talent and learning sitting within that, but also I think HR strategies have to think about more transactional aspects. So maybe looking at processes that need optimising, whether it's your recruitment, your um, disciplinary, uh, all sorts of internal performance management processes that might need to be uh, delivered. Now, interestingly, of course, um, I'd see disciplinary as sitting in an HR strategy, but I would might see performance management sitting in talent management. So here we have overlap. And then OD, to me again, OD is a quite future focused. Um, any of these things could overlap or fit into OD, but where you would do something, if you're in a talent role and you end up picking up something like change or culture, then I would suggest that that is an OD aspect of your talent role that you're picking up. So OD, generally, organisational development would include change, it would um, look at aspects of culture, and it could even look at broader business structures and processes, like the way in which you actually uh, set up the organisation. Again, overlap here with HR because that might be workforce planning, but also it might be about things like lean or business process re-engineering or Six Sigma, those sort of typical very businessy um, changes that are sometimes introduced. So that was just a way in which I, I see there are differences and similarities and perhaps overlaps. And, uh, and I hope that's a lot of interest. And I'm interested if anyone finds that um, disagrees. I'm saying that's my opinion on it. They may well disagree. I don't, I, you know, by all means, put in the comments if you agree or disagree with that previous slide. I thought it might be helpful to um, explore those differences and similarities. So now if we think about what sits into talent management and some of these things I've mentioned in other areas. 
these were the sort of typical terminology that I think you might sit within talent management and they may be things that you would be working on if you were building a talent management strategy so they're in no particular order here but we might be looking at pools of people so you might pick a talent pool which would be a group of people who have a similar set of requirements or needs now that might mean therefore you need to do a training needs analysis for them and put in place some learning and development for them it might mean that you need to assess their technical competency um, and put in place some technical development with them so you can see it's very much aligned there to development isn't it then on the other aspect, we might be looking at more about the flow of talent or a talent pipeline through the organisation. So I'm thinking here where we've got talent profiles, which might be the set of skills that people have within your business. You might have profiles which fit into job families. So you might have a job family which is around a project management job family where you're seeing that people have specific skills, qualifications and competencies and you might want to put in place a career path which particularly supports that set of skills so it might not be one interesting angle to think about in terms of career paths is when we're thinking about talent management often when you go up an organization the easiest way to do it um, or the only way to do it in many organizations is through actual management development is going into people management now, of course the reality is not everybody is a great people manager and one way of thinking about talent management and certainly i did this myself in a previous role is we did have a leadership pipeline of people going up an organization in terms of team leader through to manager so cost center manager through to director which all involved people management but we identified that we had for example a team of engineers who had really great technical skills but only a small number of them had good people skills so actually the only way it seemed at that time to give them a career in the business was by forcing them into something they weren't good at. So maybe a way of talent management, which is what we did, was looking at a technical career path where you can give people aspirations, recognition, you can give them titles, you can give them a reward, which is in line with their technical competence as they progress through a business. And then we look at things which are around retention of talent. So we've got the nine box grid here. We've got engagement of people, uh, flight risk, working out, you know, are we likely to lose some of these key, key people? Understanding their career aspirations, how can we fit them in place? And a lot of this here is about promotion, assessment for development, which is all about um, progressing people through an organization, which in itself can be a tool either to uh, upskill talent or to retain talent. Because fundamentally, the point of talent, when we look at different purposes, it is about keeping those people with the skills in the business. The term came about in probably the 90s. I think it was McKinsey that coined the term the war for talent. And it was something which uh, was where I think the, the move from things being about warm bodies to being actually it's about our skills and it's what people bring to uh, a job that become more important in terms of our discretionary effort. So we've got many, many options that might fit within if you're in a talent management role that you might just think about. So of course, how do we decide which ones we need to prioritize? Well, I would always say we need to be clear about the purpose of our talent management strategy. And we know from our earlier slide, we said it needs to align with the business goals or, or requirements. So we can think about why we might be doing this. So the purpose, I'll take a step back thinking, what is our business strategy? Now, your business strategy may change and very often a change in business strategy or change in personnel at the top can kick off a new OD or a new talent management strategy. So think for a moment, what do you think the purpose is of your own talent strategy? And if you have one or what, what are the drivers? And again, if anyone would be happy to, not everyone can see it, don't worry. If you want to just type in your views on what, what drivers you have in your organizations, start to think about those. And actually I'll put this next slide up, which might just help your thinking. So <clears throat> this slide here might help you think about this. Um, Assuming you use the term talent in your organization, and actually I won't get into the debate here, but some might say it's a term which can have 
Oh, I don't know. It depends. Some people might not like it. Uh, and it depends on maybe on how it's used in your organisation. If it's seen as a very elitist term, it can even be quite detrimental. But let's assume that it's used positively in your organisation. Now, I'm going to ask you um, to put into the comments A, B or C based on this. And you can put D if none of these um, are, are above those. So would you say that talent in your organisation is a very select small number of people and it's probably to do with performance but only a small you know high potential relatively elite group of people are considered talent well, that's what you'd label it in your organization the second one would be is it various pockets of people based on key skills um, that are you know, very important to the business so key skills that the business needs to either retain or develop um, in place or is it more of a sort of holistic talent that everyone's got talents and it's about getting the best out of everybody so if you were to be honest about your organization i won't shout you out um, which would you choose a b or c or you can go for d if it's something different or none of the above we or we don't even use that term in our organization i'm assuming actually the people who are the talent in they do use the term because you've got it in your title so i've got i've got a b currently i've got an a okay another couple of b's no one's gone for, oh and a c okay so i've got a nice spread of them so far so all of these apply i haven't had any d's yet do feel free to put in if none of those apply to you so we're already seeing that there are diverse ways in which you can have talent applied to your organization and it is an interesting one because those will have implications for your strategy and how you communicate it so if you have this which i'd say is the number a the the more traditional select five or ten percent you know high potential programs that side of things the thing you've got to be careful on there is it's great for those who are on it um but it can be demotivational to the other 90 percent so you need to make sure that the the term is used well and also that others have um opportunities too because it can be seen as quite narrow and it and as I say it can be counterproductive i've done a whole separate podcast on that conversation um b this is often quite a common one to do with skills um and the challenge you've got there sometimes is which hat to go after and you can feel pulled in, in numerous different directions what you probably want there is different pools talent pools with specific purposes so when we go on to purpose you might even find you have slightly different purpose we had for example <clears throat> in the company i worked for a, a, a talent pool which was actually legacy skills um, so these people are all uh silver foxes was the other term i'm not sure if that's a term apologies so not really to offend anyone but it was it was people in their 50s and 60s who were going to retire and they would take legacy technical skills with them and we didn't have anyone else with those skills coming through so we actually needed to keep those people in the business sufficiently um, and in order for them to mentor and pass on those skills so that was quite different from a young high potential or high flyers group and then the c which is quite a nice one which is actually more of a approach to overall engagement saying that everybody's got value the key and challenge we've got there if you've got that kind of strategy is actually understanding what people's skills are, um, maybe having the visibility and transparency of them. And uh, probably it's about empowering your managers and stuff because you can't just do this centrally. You can't manage that. You need everybody else to uh, support people in getting the most out of individuals so that they can develop. So all of those are valid terms um, and you might even have a, a mixture of the above there. So when you think about whichever one you chose a b or c probably if you think about it these could be the drivers of that so if you are in a very profit driven maybe a very competitive marketplace um that's a very highly paid visible people that uh, and it's about commercial deliverables that sort of uh, top five or ten percent approach is quite common and it is about uh, measuring performance. You might be putting things like performance related pay in. It might be about then retaining people who are in those specific areas. Those might be the drivers of it. Now, of course, if the driver that you've actually got as business and you've you've got set, if you had number A, which was five to ten percent, and actually what your organisation wants to be done is seen as a, a people driven, uh, it, all about the valuing individuals, then you might want to rethink what the talent strategy is because i'd argue that that sort of elitist talent strategy perhaps doesn't fit so well 
with that purpose so you all know the businesses that you you represent and which ones fit think about whether that that definition of talent the way in which it's done in your organization fits with the strategy in terms of the the, the driver you know the one i told the middle one is about retention of key skills and development of key skills and then probably the third one it could apply to either, but I'd say maybe if you kind of is about developing all if people that want to be seen as a top 100 employer, they might want to be seen as giving everyone the opportunity to be seen as talent and developing them. As I say, no, nothing's right or wrong, but what you do want to make sure is that these things line up and you understand why there isn't a conflict between the two. Hopefully that makes sense. So the next thing I'd ask you to think about is in terms of those talent strategies or activities on the Wordle page that we had earlier, you can't do everything. So whatever your purpose might be, um, if it is a high performance culture, then which of those talent strategies are going to be the most appropriate for that culture? So select the things that you feel will make the difference and particularly select clusters of things and group them together. One of the, I've seen many talent strategies and quite often they are they don't seem to be joined up and I'll come back to this um, it's, and it makes it hard for people to digest them and maybe even for you to get funding for them. So what you need to look at is where there are synergies between the talent interventions that you might want to put in place. So let me give you an example. You might want to put in place a technical career path. So therefore you might want to do a, a competency mapping and a technical job uh, mapping intervention and you might want to put in place assessment for development centres for these particular technical competencies. Uh, you might look at succession planning in that particular vertical of, of skill that you're trying to hold on to. So all of those would be supporting strategies that would support or flow from each other and it's much better to do that like that in clumps because you'll get synergy and then perhaps choose a separate which is more of a disparate strategy, a different approach, um, maybe time that in a different time work out which one should come first and, and choose a logical time frame or order one aspect of course is you can clump them together you can think about the logical time frame and the thing you might want to do first uh you know you might know exactly what that is but when you think about the likely effort versus the impact you may rethink i always think this is quite a useful way of thinking about things so if it's something that's going to cost you a huge amount of money or you just don't have the manpower to to get the value or it's going to be hugely hard work with relatively low impact then perhaps it's not worth doing or maybe you postpone that so you can't do everything at once so thinking about your your strategies you think think about where you're going to get your quick wins what's the logical time frame or order and where have you got synergies once you've identified those top three then you need to think about what am I actually trying to expect or anticipate the outcomes will be of these strategies and how will I measure success? Now, these last two become really important because it's very rare that your talent management strategy comes for free. You're probably going to have to go and get investment from the business. So you need to have clarity on these things and you need to be able to go and explain what the outcomes are, the metrics for measuring success and, of course, align them with the business strategy, as we spoke about earlier. And then finally, that will help you gain buy-in and commitment. Having this as a clear strategy and then maybe pulling it together into what I call a strategy on a page, and I'll give you an example later, is a great way to help people understand simply, even though your talent management strategy might be quite complex, get them to understand simply what it is you're trying to get them to do or buy into. And that might involve them supporting people to have time out of their business or time for development or, time, or, or money out of their budget. Oh, someone's asking, how do you move the mic, camera, screen and leave options so they're not covering the side? You should be able to um, just literally drag it. So if you go over and try and with your mouse, click on to the, is it the GoToMeeting thing on the black bit at the top? You should be able to then click on it and slide it to one side, Laura. You can also, you might be able to click, you might be able to minimise it as well. That's the other option using the little cross. Oh, bad luck. Sorry. <laughs> OK, I'll we'll, you can always look back at the videos. We'll send you the slides, Laura, then. <laughs> so to give, bring this to life and give you an example here, 
This is uh, just a simple case study. It's a real example of a large charity. And uh, the situation is they've got a new chief exec who's under pressure to improve performance. So it's their charity, so they have to you know, demonstrate that they're, they're performing. Um, they've various aspects uh, in which that it hasn't been optimized for some time. That has resulted in a relatively disillusioned workforce um, because they've done certain things they introduced performance related pay in the past and it failed resulting in cynicism they've tried to introduce um, systems they've got unions that have been a little bit um, cynical so lots of things are quite difficult but the, the really main thing is obviously a charity is here to deliver on its its charitable purpose it has certain roles which are really expensive to train up and those roles have got very high attrition in there so there's pre pressure to improve not just overall performance but one of the obvious things to do is to address that so looking behind the scenes, these are the different priorities. This is my brain dump, to be honest, of this um, thing. So I've only just started talking to these people. So um, one of the things they focus on is a more of an overall organizational strategy and culture, because historically, and one of the reasons that people were cynical was that things were seen as being done just about performance. It was about numbers, not people. So the culture, whatever this uh, particular organization wants to bring in this time, they want to ensure that the focus is seen to be on valuing people and their contribution. Therefore, do need to manage performance, so they're going to have another crack at performance related pay, but they want to do it properly this time and ensure that they are recognising both how people perform and also what they're doing. They have, um, they want to, in order to do that, it's all well and good to say that, but clearly the culture is being there at a certain time. They have managers who may not have those skills yet, so they need to ensure that the managers, it's all very well and this is where things get needs to be joined up. You might say that it's really simple. We're going, to imp we're going to bring in a new way of managing performance. But everything that's there historically, the management behaviours, the culture, the systems, will be reinforced in the old way. So they know that they need to educate their managers to change in that way and reinforce both types of performance. So that's probably going to mean upskilling their managers in setting goals, in giving clear feedback and more of a coaching style. Now, to keep those key roles, they know they need to offer them development and career opportunities. Hey, we've got our career paths. And they need to make sure that their systems and processes, I mentioned earlier, line up with this. There'll be other things that they need to think about. Um, one of the things, in fact, that they were doing and where this had come from is they'd already done a listening exercise. So whereas previous strategies had come in from top down, and perhaps that's why they were rejected, a lot of this has come from the fact that people don't feel valued. So they've done surveys, they've done focus groups and listened to the unions and people, and they understand that the core issue is people not feeling valued. So then that means if you think back to our earlier slide, what's the purpose of the talent management strategy here is actually it's about valuing people in this environment. That is the priority. And what you don't want to do is make it all around a performance related pay um, implementation because that actually could be counterproductive. It's about what comes first and making sure that the messaging actually supports the purpose of this particular new strategy. And then all of those aspects there, you would, I would personally put them into a series of slide uh, uh, PowerPoints and explain each one in detail and say what the deliverables are, et cetera. But just for a summary, one thing that I've always found helpful is coming up with a way where you get all of your thoughts onto one page. This is a quick and dirty because I've used the, um, you know, the word art in, in PowerPoint. But I've just said, OK, there's actually four priorities here for this talent management strategy. In the centre, it's, it's about both a high people and performance culture. So it's not just a high performance culture. It's not just a high valuing people culture. It's high people and performance is what we're trying to achieve. Now, in order to do that, we're saying they need to build and retain trust. So it can't be just doing this. It's got to have a level of bottom up in it. It's going to be absolutely critically important to train our managers because they could undermine it if they carry on behaving the old ways. We need to put in place ways to develop our career, our specialists, specific support and development for those in key roles so that they aspire to stay with the organisation. And then we need to underpin it all with the right systems and processes which make it sustainable. So they're going to introduce performance related pay, but they need to make sure that they are able to measure the how. So they're looking at behaviours, not just the what. They'll need to make sure that managers know how to manage performance in such a way. 
so it's, oh, it's there and it's visible um, and it's and it's well calibrated but it's not just those things there the processes they'd also get visibility of talent so that they can develop people and move people around the organization so those are just four chunks that people can get their head around so if you could present that to your stakeholders and they go you go look there's four priorities it hooks to, onto our four, these are our four whatever they might be, and you come up with ones which are relevant to your organization. But you've then got your strategy on a page, which is your big picture version. Behind it, you've probably got a series of other slides or more detailed information with your outputs, your deliverables. But everybody understands what it is you're trying to achieve, and you can always link back this big picture. So that was the end of my um, how to build a talent management strategy. I'm always conscious at lunchtime that people are relatively short of time. Um, we have another webinar if this is of interest to you, which you can register and um, Helen will um, let you know. You can register by the website just to let you know of this. Um, we also have some uh, white papers and other information that might be of value to you. So for example, um, We've done a podcast on succession planning, which obviously fits into talent management, and there's a white paper that you can access from Actus, any of those. Uh, the podcast, the links to all of the podcasts we've done, and as I said, I'm going to record what we've just talked about as a podcast version as well. So if that works better for you um, and you don't want to see the video, although we will video this, uh, we'll save the recording and make it accessible to you, then that's available too. And then one final thing just to make you aware of in case um, you're interested is we've just kicked off some training programs. So we've got uh, one day change superhero training. If any of you are actually part of delivering a strategy is actually driving the change. So we have a change superhero one day. Of the first one's coming up on the 2nd of April and also some HR mastermind groups, which are very small select groups of like minded individuals. They meet for six to 12 weeks once or twice once or twice a month um, and it's all about uh, individual collaboration learning together sharing ideas so any of those you want to know more about you can find out from the website and I'm just going to go into my final slide so you can feel free to message me has anyone got any questions that came up from that presentation um, or comments or observations or how you know whether it's something relevant for you what your talent management strategies are Yes. So there's a question about um, the, the pipeline, talent pipeline. Um, that is something that I, is a great book, actually, I recommend called The Leadership Pipeline, if you've never heard of it. Uh, thanks, guys. Anyone has, has dropped off, completely understand. Um, yeah, it's pipeline called Ram Sharan. And actually, we built an entire talent management um, strategy against that. And I did uh, this leadership pipeline where we put development for our managers um, in place with that. And also we put uh, in, you can't see what I'm doing, but I'm doing, if you imagine a, a, a zigzag up a page, one angle of it was going up a leadership traditional hierarchy. And the other way of going up was a technical hierarchy. And it worked really well. I'm glad that's um, Rachel that's that might be um, useful for you the leadership pipeline for your CIPD module yes we will definitely send you the slides and once the uh, video has rendered you'll have access to the video as well just message us if you want further information any other questions that anyone wants to type in on the comments I'm happy to take one-to-one -one questions or otherwise Got lots of thanks, no specific questions. Do feel free to message me separately if you want to. I'm happy to have those chats as well. So thank you very much. Thanks everyone who's saying thank you. Um, really appreciate you commenting in there. It's just nice to know there's people there. Um, and have a great afternoon and rest of your weeks. Thanks guys, bye.